David Riggs started with a picture. I love it. For those on the, the video, you could see the. the I was going to say, I was trying photo. to get it real quick before it went. I was like, I got to I gotta get it for the, uh, the memory book. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, documenting is something really important, I feel like, and maybe something we'll talk about today. But to get into it, I'd love to start with, he must become greater, I must become less. What does yeah. that mean to you? It's, uh, it is the Bible verse that I kind of let guide who I am and what I do. So I recently, and I think this goes for a lot of people that are faith-based, but personally, I'm a Christian. I think it, it, it changes as you grow, right? So I was a Christian, not because I wanted to, but because I went to a Christian school. I was raised up. I went to church. But, you know, past four or five years, I, I've really gotten back into it. And it's one of those things that that verse really stuck to me because of a couple of things, right? Uh, the world of entrepreneurship is a lot about me, 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 and all that I can do and all that can I achieve. And I think for me, uh, and you'll hear me say this, it's like I own nothing and borrow everything. So the business's success is borrowed. The retainers that I'm getting from clients or payments, right? They're just, I'm, they're borrowing, I'm borrowing their cash. So like the success of everything I have is borrowed because it's not really mine. It's, it's what I'm going to give credit to like uh, my faith, Christianity, like the, the, the Lord's success, right? Like I'm, borrowing that from him and he's grateful enough to give it to me. Um, and whether you're a, a faith-based person or not, for anyone listening as well, it, it's really changed the way I live because uh, I don't get too attached to anything, which is, I think, helpful. But, you know, it gets me in a good spot of like, enjoy it while you have it. Don't, you know, really care when it's gone because you've got the good benefit of it. And it always keeps me moving forward of like, you know, I'm just kind of living in this life. There, there's definitely a plan set out for me and I get to experience it day in and day out. But uh, for me being a faith believer, right, uh, a lot of this stuff is predestined. It's kind of set out for me and, you know, so many different arguments and we can get into that. But uh, no, it's interesting for me. That verse has definitely like guided me in the sense of I'm not the one doing anything. I'm just following the path that was laid out for me. And it really challenges me to take my <laughs> humans have ego really challenges me to take my ego out of a lot of situations and just remind myself that like uh, there's a lot of things that factor and I just get to enjoy the success or failures that are put in front of me as in treat them as opportunities. So, okay. A lot to break down there. How does believing that it's a predetermined path help you or hurt you when making decisions? If you say, okay, this is a decision that's already been made. I'm thinking about it. It's on my mind, but it's already been made. It's predetermined. Is that what you think? Like, how does that, how does that process work? Yeah, I think for me, and there are so many different views on this. I think for me personally, it, it helps me start to treat things as opportunities, um, right? Because if it's been predetermined, it's been preset. Uh, there's probably a reason, right? That I'm going through this or I'm encountering this, right? So now it becomes an opportunity for me. Um, I'll give you a really easy example. Like this, this week has been crazy. Uh, we we lost two of our larger clients. Just you know, naturally, as the business goes on, you can't keep everybody forever. Again, I'm borrowing that retainer from them. I stopped borrowing them this week, and we landed two more. Really, you know, up and down roller coaster, full entrepreneurship week, and it gave me a really good opportunity of like, all right, if that was predestined and, and that was meant to happen, and that was already in the the future plan for David Riggs. Okay, what, what can I learn from it? Like, let's take out the fact that I can't change that. It allows me to put a little bit more emphasis on, okay, what can I learn from it? Because if that is going to be something that I'm interacting with and coming across my plate and I can't stop it, okay, well, let's use it to the advantage. So, you know, we, we reviewed how we communicate with clients and we reviewed, you know, as clients get closer to this end life cycle, which always happens, what can we do to actually better prepare them to leave us? How can we better plan them to make sure they're educated on what we're doing? Um, things like that. So it really helps me treat things as an opportunity that if the ball's rolling, I can work really hard to stop something that's going to always continue to roll, or I can learn from it, use it to my advantage and make sure that I'm better prepped next time. Or, you know, it, it helps me, uh, I guess, kind of inform myself on future decisions that, you know, I'm, I'm younger, two years in business, I'll probably have to face a similar thing, 10, 20, 30 years in business. So yeah, really just see it as like an opportunity and a, a true learning lesson. I know it's cliche, but it's one thing that's really helped me of like, if I can't stop the ball and bad things are going to happen as much as good things. I might as well learn from both. That makes a lot of sense. And so what was the moment where you said to yourself, okay, I'm going to start an agency and this is going to be what I devote myself to. Yeah. I never had one of those moments. Uh, to be honest, I was one that 
was always infatuated with business. So it goes back to college. Uh, I was a financial economics major um, and hated virtually every class I took. Um, it was all like hard finance, but the ones that I enjoyed were two. One of them was like a corporate finance class. And it was really just like breaking down businesses and seeing, I call it the wheel of business personally, like in our business, but how companies can take a dollar, what that wheel is to then output a dollar fifty, right? So the business, right, is just a set of processes to turn a dollar into a buck fifty or two fifty, three fifty. Love that, was infatuated by it. As a it then a nineteen, eighteen, nineteen year old, uh, you can't really go into a business and tell them how to change their systems and processes because you're a nineteen year old kid that I didn't know anything. Uh, but what I did was like, okay, what did I know? What, what do I know immensely well that other companies don't know that I think I have a leg up? And again, it's probably within your arms reach of phone, social media, things like that. So I actually started doing some social media management and marketing. It's the first gig out of like really in college to just get into uh, companies to see their ops and things like that. Um, and really, you know, I didn't mean to do this. It, it kind of morphed into the agency of I was just freelancing to have fun. You know, I always think I was doing websites for like 150, 250 social posts for like 100 a month. Like I was just having a blast getting to see the back end of these businesses. And then I started realizing that, you know, okay, I don't think I'm meant for this, uh, this W-2 thing. Um, I interned at a couple pretty large companies, one that was a Fortune 500, uh, and never got good feedback. I think one of the feedbacks the last year was like, moves too quick, not detail oriented, uh, too busy networking was one of the ones as well, because within this like nine week, eight week internship, which is always a funny story, my boss at the internship had never met the CEO of the company. He didn't know where the office was. He had never interacted with him. Uh, I think by week seven, I had an hour long lunch with the CEO and was just hanging out in his office, like making friends with them. So I, one, I don't think I had made any friends with that internship because everybody was like, how did he do that? But yeah, that was my feedback. So I was like, I don't think this W2 thing's cut out for me. This business thing, though, like I'm working with these companies, you know, I'm not making enough to live off of, but maybe I could. And I got really interested in like, I wasn't going to be able to want to do it, but how could I start building the team and starting to like input this like love of business into other people and have them kind of do the work that I was doing? Uh, and really, man, that, that was the start of like NUMA today was just finding businesses that wanted to work that needed a young college kid to figure out their online marketing and internet things. Uh, and yeah, and it's grown into to websites and SEO with kind of still that pure focus of the love of business. So I always say that, you know, on, on paper, if you were to look at us as like a formalized company, like we're an agency. Um, but I tend to say, like, I, I wish I could change it to like where you're, you're kind of in-house augmented staff in a way, because like I'm getting my hands into the company. We had a conversation yesterday with a, an SEO client um, and we were building a job description for them because I'm immensely interested in like how these people are going to hire and like what role they're going to literally like we were building a job description to replace our team. And I love it because like my hands in the business. So uh, NUMA has really become like this uh, extension of my love of just getting under the hood of businesses, tweaking, fixing, operating, learning about what they're doing. Um, and with kind of that just being the end goal for now, of just like learning about all these other businesses and, and hopefully getting a chance to invest in some down the road. Is the mission to recreate some of these businesses in the future with yourself at the helm? In a way, I, I'm not even sure recreate would be the right word. I think uh, I love, we were talking about this kind of in the, in the waiting room, so to speak, uh, but just like good people, right? Like good people, know good people, things like that. Uh, mine is always, I, I don't have as much want to go zero to one with a new business. That was probably one of the hardest things I did. And I didn't really know it was hard, but like looking back on it, it was stressful. Um, but I would love to help someone else go one to 10 because that is a blast. And, you know, NUMA might not be at the 10, but like we're over that hump of zero to one. We're, we're in that scaling momentum phase. It's a blast. Like I wake up happy every day and, and some of the zero to one wasn't the case. Um, and I think if finding those good people, investing into them is where I'd love to go down the line of, you know, find somebody that's grown an SEO company that's struggling at the, at the very beginning, or, you know, maybe a, a legal firm that I have good handles in because I've seen the ops being on the marketing side, but getting my hands into a business and things like that. My goal down the line, uh, if you're familiar with somebody named Alex Hormozzi, post post a lot of content, but he has a, a company called acquisition.com. That model is what I've really been working for for a long time of, you know, it doesn't have to be anything flashy or special, but there's a lot of good people out there running good businesses that haven't quite figured out that one to 10 
formula to really get the momentum to get over that hump. Uh, Numa is really the the test run of that uh, and really already working on it this year. But within the next two to three years, when I have a couple businesses under the portfolio to say, hey, you know, I'm helping so-and-so grow their agency, grow their business, grow their firm, whatever it may be, um, based on that prior experience and, and kind of hedge a bet on what I've learned and, and help apply it to other businesses. So you've been running Numa for, what is it, 14 months now? About, yeah. Numa formalized with its first real employee and everything for, yeah, right at 14 months. Has this been the 14 month period of greatest growth in your life? Yeah, man. I was, uh, I was thinking about that a while back. Cause somebody asked me a very similar question. I, I forget the business growth quite a bit. And I really start looking at the personal growth because I want to always say to our employees as well, bi- business problems are personal problems. If you're, if you're not an apple size, uh, if you have problems in the business, like you don't actually have business problems. You have personal problems and you got to hunt the personal side of things down first and then the rest will resolve. Um, and for me, the, the business has grown off of the back that I've been uh, immensely obsessed with this weird thing called personal development for really the, not even the past 14 months, like the past three, four or five years of like, uh, I read Atomic Habits, I think, right whenever it came out. And I love the book. I think James Clear is great. The only thing I really remember from that book is get 1% better every single day. And that has just kind of been the guiding motto of like, if if I notice not an efficiency, and that might not be the right word, but like notice something I can prove personally, that becomes the goal of like, how can I improve that? So for me, it's been a lot of, especially in the last 14 months coming to light of like, we don't have much, uh, like many of our goals aren't set on outputs. They aren't revenue goals. They aren't, um, I guess like output goals like that. It's very input driven. So if we have a revenue goal, we actually backtrack it to an input goal and really make sure that personally we are ready to have that input goal achieve that input goal and go from there. For me, it's read 20, like one of them is read 20 pages of a book a day. Cause I know that's going to have a really good output of what I wanted to go after. So yeah, man, the 14 months has been fun. I'd almost say the, the most fun I had was prior to the 14 months, uh, because running a seven figure business and trying to build others, uh, you get faced with all sorts of weird problems, right? Like I spent an hour on the phone yesterday with a lawyer, not my like ideal way to spend my lunch hour. But the, the 14 months before the latest 14 months was such a blast because I was just waking up and like, I had one goal, like invest in myself, figure out how I could become a better person. And dude, that's just some of the most fun, carefree time because you don't have any goals. Like you just wake up and, and you're working on yourself. And uh, it's one of the best investments I think I made. But yeah, it, it's just been a, it's been a fun roller coaster that has its ups and downs, but in general is going up. And yeah, it's been a blast. So take me through some of the problems you've solved personally that has led to business growth in the past 14 months. Yeah, one of them is uh, even kind of facing it now. We, we all have that weird gut feeling of like what is right and what is wrong. Um, I don't think anyone would disagree. Like we, we have that gut feeling. Acting on it uh, is a whole different story. And I, I think it's really one of those things that like breaking down one, like we, we know we should probably act or at least think on it, but two, like what is my process that I hold myself to that when I have a gut feeling, like what do I actually need to go and do personally uh, to make sure professionally I'm going to be there. Right. So for me, it was, I used to have a gut feeling, ignore it, wait for it to blow up in my face and then spend 10 times as long fixing the problem that I could have fixed with an email or a text or whatever. So nowadays we have, I personally have a one call rule. So if I have a gut feeling that something's broken or something's happening or anything like that, it's a one call to that person presenting the fact that I have a gut feeling and really not hanging up the phone call until whatever it is that's bothering me is resolved, right? So, you know, maybe I have a gut feeling that someone's unhappy in in the business and and one of our employees isn't, you know, something else is bothering them. I have that gut feeling and our our team will attest. It could be a 7 a.m. call or a 7 p.m. call, but I'm I'm calling you instantly, uh, presenting the fact that I have that feeling and, you know, expect a a certain level of return from the other side of like, "This this is what's bothering me. Like, thank you for addressing it. Let's just tackle this and go head on. Um, and that's like a really easy example, but I think there are other ones as well in the sense of, you know, how I'm managing my own fear. And I think one of the most inter- interesting things I've learned is, uh, I guess uh, in an analogy, you probably have like an iPhone or an iPad, right? What good would it be to have, uh, you know, your iPhone 13, which I have with running on like iOS 4, right? You're, you're missing out on all the potential. Well, 
the human brain kind of works like that in the sense of like, once you get to eight or nine, you stop really updating your OS. You get bigger and physically stronger, mentally stronger, but you never really have the operating system to run that. So I think one thing I'm always interested in is like the mental models about like, when something happens in life, uh, you can either react or respond. And a lot of times we're re just reacting the way eight, nine, 10 year old you would react and you're not responding in the present moment. And that was just one of the interesting things of like, you know, if a, if a client says we didn't do a good job, you know, I used to, and I still kind of do, like I go into this fright mode, I'm like, okay, well, why? Like they can't expect us to hit a home run every time. And then it's kind of breaking down, like, you know, what scenario whenever I was younger as a kid that this like happened to me, like what mental model have I literally carried through 20 years of life that I shouldn't be carrying through 20 years of life. And I think that's one framework that I really use to hunt down problems of, you know, if I have a weird reaction that I don't like today, I immediately go to like the eight, nine, 10 year old me and try and figure out like, where did I like formulate this mental model to say like, this is how I need to be reacting to these conversations and how can I like be conscious about it and try and break it in the future. What's the eight, nine, 10, why not one, two, three, four, five, six, like where did eight to 10 come from? Uh, honestly, eight to 10 for me, I can't remember one to seven to save my life. It's just hazy. Uh, so that's part of it, but eight to 10, there's a lot of science of like, at that age, that's when you really start developing your mental models, but that's when it starts like tailing off. So like from one to two to three to four, you might be updating mental models daily. Once you get to eight, nine and 10, those updates really start to drop off a cliff. So like, you know, you might be updating a mental model every week, let's say. Once you get to that eight, nine, 10, maybe 11, you might be updating like once a year to where then you get to like 13, 14, 15, you're just stuck or, you know, not stuck, but you're just using what you've developed in the past and you don't update it at all. Um, and for me, eight, nine, 10, 11 was where, you know, personally, like my family was moving. I was changing schools, doing a lot of different new things. That's where a lot of like, I, I put craziness happened. I think that's where a lot of like my business mental models and personal mental models have it kind of stemmed from in a way. What was the craziest thing that happened? Uh, I was in three high schools in four years. Uh, this last weekend I moved again. I think it was, we're in, we're in double digit moves now, but yeah, three high schools in four years, a little bit older, past eight to 10. That was hectic. Um, I don't know if you're ever the new kid. Being the new kid's not fun. Uh, and I got to be the new kid three times. Uh, but it was one of those things that it really challenged me. It was just crazy of the fact that like, that's where I really got into that John 3.30 verse of like, man, I didn't plan for this. I don't think my parents planned for this, but it totally happened. I, I should just make the most out of it. Um, but yeah, man, it, it was, those three high schools in four years was a pretty big impact of just like how I kind of learned about myself, figured out myself and definitely think it caused me to grow up a little bit quicker than I think what I should have. Um, yeah, being, being the new kid challenges you to think a little bit differently, but you you'll learn about yourself a little bit quicker because you're, you're uncomfortable. Uh, you know, for four years in a row, you're almost uncomfortable daily. You get a lot of growth from that. What was the most uncomfortable part about being the new kid? Yeah, I think, um, I, I it sounds stupid. I don't know how to make friends. Uh, you don't know how to talk to people. If you're never the new kid, you're always in an environment where someone else is making that introduction. Like, you know, my parents are introducing me to someone else's kids and we instantly become friends. But like, you never really facilitated that introduction. So I walked in freshman year to a brand new high school, knew nobody, uh, and also nobody was there to make friends for me. So you quickly realize that like a lot of people in, in the world today don't actually know how to make friends. And it's a weird skill set that you learn from being the new kid. But that was the biggest thing for me of learning lesson of like, like I know no one. I'm in a school of 4,000 people. I have no friends. Nobody knows who I am. You know, how do I meet somebody new today and every single day to you just make friends and, and have something to do outside of school, but also like challenge myself to get a little uncomfortable as well. Uh, and that was probably the biggest skill set because I am an introvert at heart, um, but have tendencies to where I'm extroverted. And I think it definitely plays well in business, but would have never had that skill set and, and level of comfortability if I wouldn't have been challenged to, you know, walk in a lunchroom. And, and the thing that I'm thinking of in, in my head is like walking into a lunchroom having no one to sit next to, having no one yeah. to talk to, right? Like, okay, how do I approach that situation? Because it's comfortable as a 24-year-old now, it's more uncomfortable whenever you're a freshman in high school, you don't know anybody. Um, so that was definitely one of like, you learn real quick how to just meet people, connect with people, build rapport with people, you know, look them in the eyes, mirror what they're doing, 
remember their name it is always a good one. Uh, but yeah, you, you learn those little things just from being the new kid that I, I carry with me. So what do you do on on that day in walking into yeah, the cafeteria? Yeah, I was said on the first day, uh, I walked in, got an Uncrustable uh, and sat in the bathroom for a good 45 minutes because I knew nobody. And uh, as God is my witness, I was not going to walk up to somebody on that first day. I was all over the place. It was like, somebody's going to come talk to me. I stood there for five minutes. Nobody did. Uh, yeah, I literally sat in the bathroom. I think day two, uh, I sat in the gym. Uh, and then day three, um, I finally met one person in one of my classes uh, because I commented on the fact that he was a soccer fan and I, I played uh, college soccer. We connected, hit it off, uh, and I still literally talk to the kid to this day. Uh, he was the wow. only person that I met. But uh, yeah, it was little things like that of, uh, I found real quick that you just have to connect with people and it's not all that scary. But you know, there's uh, a lot of similarities between like, I'm sure you and I, but probably anybody that you've connected with, right? We're at the end of the day, people, you probably all watch Netflix or read books or have interests and things like that. And you really got to dig for those interests and find that commonality to, to bring people together. And it's cliche. I'm sure plenty of people have written about that same idea. But for me, it was like this mind blowing thing of like, well, like we just, we both like soccer and now we're friends. Like it was that easy. Uh, and that was a big aha moment for me as a kid. But yeah, to, to go back to the other point, uh, if you can envision freshman David, I was literally not in a stall. I was just sitting on the sink. Uh, Perry Meridian High School, freshman year in Indianapolis, uh, eat my Uncrustable. <laughs> and it's crazy how it stays with you to the Dude, point sure. where you know it's foundational to who you are yeah. today. And so I guess on that topic, how did moving three times and going to four different, three high schools in four years, how did that help you when helping people get TED Talks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny. And what I'd say in, in a good way, you kind of get numb to, uh, like that celebrity feel of, I'll give you an example. I was a fr freshman or sophomore, uh, and met Peyton Manning for the first time. And, you know, I grew up in Indianapolis, so Colts fans. Uh, and I had like a fanboy moment. I freaked out, dude. I love Peyton Manning. Um, but what I realized is my dad had a, a role more in the city. He, he was, public facing. So you're meeting a lot of these people. And I met Peyton Manning one day, the next day I was meeting the mayor. Uh, the next day I was meeting uh, Tony Kanaan uh, and any car driver. Like I immediately, as this young kid, I was meeting all sorts of people. Uh, I worked uh, at the Indy 500 one year and was meeting like Chris Pine, Lady Gaga, like all these big names. And I, I didn't really notice it until honestly, like a couple of years ago that, you know, I was just kind of numb to the fact like these are just people to me, which is a good thing. So as I'm, you know, helping them with TED Talks or reaching out and, and communicating, which was kind of my first hustle, uh, you know, I felt like they were just another person. Like there wasn't a, a hump I had to get over. It was really easy for me to just go and connect with these people. So I'm reaching out to people with hundreds of thousands of followers or, you know, uh, millionaires on people, whatever you want to say. Like, and I, I had a, a really special and candy ability to just connect with them as people. Um, and I really think that's the biggest thing that moving helped me do. But both in school, but also outside of school, you know, man, I'm in these rooms with people that I don't really need to be in rooms with. I was not necessarily bringing value as a freshman or sophomore, junior in high school. Uh, but my dad definitely challenged me to come along. And yeah, I, I think one of those big aha moments that I still come to today that uh, the people that we, you know, idolize and look up to, they are people. They're just like us. They're going to have the same problems, uh, same problems and opportunities. And I'll even give the example yesterday. Like I still kind of had a moment of, uh, we got on a call with a, a company I really look up to, but the founder I really look up to and have followed him for a long time. And he jumps on the call and dude, like five minutes in, we're just jamming on talking about headphones, not, not uh, ironically. So it's just one of those things that like I really got used to, it, but uh, it gives me a good opportunity just to connect with people. And I think that is the biggest thing of like moving, but growing up at that time, uh, connecting with people is an underrated skill. And I think a lot of people just assume that it's a, uh, you start chatting with somebody and you're good to go, but it's, there's definitely a little bit of a strategy to it or like a, an unspoken, like unconscious tactic that you get better at. And that was one of the biggest impacts, but one of the biggest things that I definitely learned in that time of just everybody's a person, everybody has their, their pros and cons and their highs and lows and find a way to connect with them on that level and you'll be in a good spot. Yeah. You talk to enough people and you talk to enough high status people, you eventually find out that everyone puts on their pants the same exact way. Yeah. Uh, well, but, funny enough, uh, 
I'll, I'll bring it full circle. I met Peyton Manning when I was younger. Uh, I live in Denver now, and obviously Manning played for the Broncos. Uh, I walk out of church two weeks ago, and Peyton Manning's right next to me. And we strike up no like a way. good, quick, five, ten-minute conversation. Uh, and it was one of those things that like, I had a, a weird moment there of, like, like, I think, honestly, probably a decade ago at the age of right now, I was like, I, I probably shed a tear and freaked out. And now it's just like it's another person that played football that – uh, is slightly taller than me, and he's just a good guy. Like, uh, it's uh, it's just a funny thing to experience, man. Of like coming full circle. Like these are all people. Like you said, they put your pants on the same way. They go walk and get their seven dollar coffees. At least some of them, like I do. Uh, and, yeah, they just they just live life, man. Man, maybe you and Peyton have a a future together in some business maybe, venture or something like that. Maybe. Oh well, I, I definitely plugged the business. Um, I don't think he <laughs> he he grabbed it, but uh, he. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, you know, just chatting up with his kid. It was, I think, the the day before the national championship game. So he was all excited to go back and, like, watch it. I was just, like, just like me. He was excited to sit down and watch the game. I was, just, Yeah, it was just a, it was a cool moment. One thing that Peyton's done extremely well is the, his social media game, at least on Omaha Productions. I've been yep. very – I've looked at their Twitter account, and I've been very impressed by how they, they navigate and how they – are able to put things out there. I think it's just very forward thinking and it's, it's smart. Their, their interpretations of how him putting on the, the show and then that leading to great content on social media. Has, yeah. Have you looked at that at all? Do you know what I'm I've looked about? at it a little bit. I need to probably, now I need to go study it a bit more. Um, yeah. But Omaha no, he, fraud on Twitter. He's got that. He's got that. Uh, he's got a children's hospital in Indianapolis as well. Uh, He's he's got his arms in a lot of different things. I think highly of him, both because I was from Indianapolis, but he's one of the the people that it's just it's interesting that like a lot of people can put him on the pedestal and rightly so because he's done some cool stuff. But yeah, he's just uh, a person like the rest of us. Yeah, exactly. So kind of switching gears here, I'd love to talk yeah. about the the coaching in twenty twenty one. It says you spent twenty thousand dollars on coaching. Yeah. I'm curious. Who who do you spend it on, or what people, and and what do you learn from this? Yeah, well, I even say we'll we'll spice it up a bit. That was just on coaching. I think I spent another rough math, like eleven to twelve grand on courses. So we'll throw in the bucket of like close to thirty grand last year in, in self education. Um, I spent it on a couple of different things. So on the coaching side, I did a like a coach that was very specific to agencies. Uh, his name is Jordan Ross. He helped me a ton, just slice through. The learning curve. Like, I, I think I would have been to where I'm at today, but we might have been having this conversation in three, four, five years. We're having it now, right? So I think that was a big thing. If he just helped me really cut down on the learning curve and speed up the learning process. Uh, and the other one I did was uh, Dave Goodall at a, at a company called Tap Mental. Um, and hence the name, like tapping into your mental programming, where I learned a lot about like the OS and things like that of your brain, like challenging yourself to really like figure out why you have these mental models. So those were the two. Um, We'll probably do the same thing again this year. Like that, that 20k budget line might happen again uh, this year for me, just because it was that impactful. And then on the courses side, man, I have a weird. Uh, it comes from Mark Cuban, uh, who I have a. He's another one that I, I look up to, but uh, it comes from Mark Cuban. He has a really good thing of like buy a book, and he's like, look, like if you learn one thing in one sense of the book, it's going to be worth the menial twenty dollars that you pay. I, I looked at it, but it was a little more aggressive. I was like, if there's anything that I want to know and it's under a grand, I'm going to buy it. Uh, so I bought multiple different courses that I was just like, would buy it, go through it 90 minutes later, grab two or three things, on to the next. Um, yeah, I was definitely in a mode last year of just like, how quickly can I learn and go implement and turn around and do that? Um, but yeah, man, it's one of those things that like, I think somebody might have actually replied to that tweet or something. It was sort of like, did you see an ROI? Or like, what was the ROI? Maybe it was a DM. It's one of those things that like I can't give you an ROI because it's still like impacting me and it probably will still impact me, right? Like that thirty grand or whatever is entirely invaluable because I guarantee you I'm using that stuff a decade, two decades, three decades from now because it has completely altered the way I see myself, I see the business, I see relationships and things like that. Um, that's my two cents on it. I always tell people that, that that's the best investment you can make is in yourself. It's one of the few asset types that's gonna continually go up and up and up over time. And you could be pretty confident in that, but yeah, I'm a big, uh, it, it hurt a little bit at the time. And I remember one of the most expensive ones I did was, uh, 
a $7,500 program slash community slash course and things like that. Um, that would hurt. Uh, I'm pretty sure at the time I didn't have enough credit limit on the business credit card. So I had to do two payments. So like I probably didn't have any, any means to go pay for this, but I did. And, uh, it one, we come back to it a lot, like of just getting uncomfortable really helps find that growth. But that course alone, man, have met close friends, people that are clients, people that are partners, people that I've now paid to help grow my business. And it's, uh, yeah, it's one of those things that like, it's always a good spin, but it is what you make of it. And that's the one caveat I always give with coaching. You can pay, you could do the exact same thing. I just did and end up $30,000 less uh, because you didn't actually take anything and implement it. I think that it's like coaching so often will give you the what to do and the, and the, it'll give you the way in which you need to go about implementing something because so often we, we know what to do. We know how to do it, but we need that final push. And I'm curious from your perspective, like what was some of the biggest takeaways from all that money spent? Yeah. One thing, uh, the more you invest, the more likely you are to use it, at least for me personally of, you know, there's a lot of books I can go read for $20 that are probably going to give me the same secrets. And I put that in quotes because they're not really secrets, but I think whenever I turn around and invest at 7,500 that course, you, you better believe, I, I don't know if I even had the TV on for two or three months. I was diving deep into that course because I was like, I got to go kind of earn my money back. Like I got to make it worth what I just did. And that was one of the things learning about myself, about how to motivate it. And if there's something I want to do, I'll even give an example now, like there's, uh, I'm trying to get a, a project done. Can't quite get it over the hump. Uh, it's important to me. I just don't have the time, but it hasn't been a, a, a big priority based on other things. Immediately went and hired it out, uh, spent some money on it. And now I'm like in tune with it. Like I, I want it to happen because I know there's somebody there. So I learned that's a little bit of like, you got to get invested in the solution uh, to really make sure it happens. And I think a lot of people will see courses as like, yeah, I can do it without spending the money. You probably can. Uh, it might take a little while. You're going to lose the accountability and lose the focus. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing I learned of like 30,000, 300,000, 3 million, whatever I end up spending in the future. It's the fact that you're spending money on yourself, really challenge yourself to go earn it back. Um, and I think that's, it's something I learned from a mentor. He ran a business, ended up, you know, eight, eight and a half, somewhere in that mid eight figures range. 1% of uh, profits every year was devoted to his like self-education. Um, that that 1% quickly adds up when you're playing with numbers of his size. And he's like, it actually became a challenge. So he was like, one year I had to go spend um, something like 100,000, 150,000 on coaching. And he was like, I actually struggled to go, like, I didn't know what I needed. And he was like, I didn't know what I could even do at that level. And he hunted it for the full year and ended up doing like it's a huge coaching program and like challenge himself to do it again next year and go earn that money back. Um, yeah, it's an interesting, weird motivation, at least for me personally. I don't think everybody's wired like that. Um, but yeah, that, that was the biggest thing I learned of like, uh, once I invested, I was very committed to the outcome um, because one, I wanted to get my money back. But two, I was like, I made this investment in myself. I can't let myself down either. And I was like, this future self really want to see me spend 7,500 and never log in and go engage with the community or the program or things like that. Yeah, that makes sense. What are you hoping to gain from the money you make? <sighs> Yeah, that's a really good one. So I, uh, and this is what I feel strongly about. So if, if I ramble, you can stop me, but go for right, it. Uh, I worked at a W2 job briefly out of college. Um, I can't tell you why I did it. I shouldn't have done it because I knew what was rolling. It was making enough money, but that's a different topic. And we might touch on it, but you know, as, as I was gearing up to leave, I told everybody I was going to leave and somebody was like, money isn't everything. Just remember that. Uh, and it kind of stuck with me in a weird way because I actually do think, uh, money is everything as long as you know what to do with it. Um, and again, it's a little bit of a hot take, but you know, Danny, right. If I asked you what's, if money didn't matter, what's the one thing that you wanted to do in the world? And, and you, you'd have an answer. Uh, but then I'm like, okay, why haven't you done it? And your next answer is going to be because I don't have the money to, uh, and I think right money is, is a tool. It is not inherently good or bad. Instagram's a tool. It's not inherently good or bad. It's how people use it. Um, and for me, it's always, if, if somebody has a good, clear vision, I don't think making money out to be, be the bad thing is necessarily the, the bad thing, right? So for me, that 
that end goal is actually trying to just take money out of the equation. How quickly can I get to the point in which I'm not thinking about money? Not that I'm going to go spend it on a Lamborghini or Ferrari because I'm also a financial economics major in college and uh, an oil change on one of those is way too expensive for me. But, you know, how can I use that tool and again, find a will to where I can put a dollar in and a dollar fifty or two dollars worth of value comes back out? You know, can I put it into local businesses and local churches? Can I put it back into people that need it? And I think for me, it's there's a lot of good that you you want to do in the world. And the one underlying currency to go do good is, is going to be the cash that you have uh, put on hand to actually go make it happen. So that's kind of the end goal, both NUMA, but personally, is how quickly can I just remove money from the equation to where I can wake up each and every day, have an asset that's going to help fund uh, my goals, my vision, my values, my mission, whatever, whatever you want to put there. Um, and, and that's, yeah, that's really kind of the end goal for me. And I always kind of shudder at the fact that people are like, you know, money's evil. Don't, don't focus on money. Man, if you avoid it, you're never going to get it. Like if your brain triggers it as bad, you're always going to like push away opportunities that are, are going to allow you to go make it. And, and again, I don't think money's bad. There, there are plenty of great things that people have done with money, build schools in, in other countries, build schools in their own backyard where they actually need it. Um, yeah, I think all those things is that's really been a, a recent thing of mine of just our world has this thing of that money's taboo. We don't talk about it. Uh, but all the people in my tight knit circle, my I quote unquote personal board of directors, and they don't know that they're personal board of directors, but right, they know how much I make, I know how much they make, and, and we both know where we're putting our assets and putting our cash and where we're investing. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting thing that I've, I've grown up with, but um, yeah, man, it's just one of those things. That's kind of the end goal that these mentors that I'm looking at, they're doing a lot of good in the world and the underlying commonality is that they make a ton of money to fund their mission and vision. So you touched on it briefly there, but like, what is the mission and vision long-term? Yeah, it, it comes back to what we talked about at the beginning. I'm, I got into this business thing to just help other people use their business as vehicles to go get more of, of whatever they're going for, right? So finding good people that have a really strong vision of value, like I really have come to understand myself as a fact that like, I just want to help people go get that. And, and that really is my vision and mission that, you know, every entrepreneur on Twitter will tell you to, uh, to guard your time and right, put it behind a paywall and don't talk to people and don't let people pick your brain. Uh, it's like my favorite hobby. Like it just gets me excited for the day and for the week that if I can go help someone get closer to their mission and vision, like that just fires me up to go get mine. Right. So, uh, and that really has become my, my mission and vision and partially why I'm, I'm getting on Twitter now and kind of sharing like lessons learned for the first year or so, but really just honing on the fact that like, uh, it's, I want to be an open book for a lot of people in the sense of like, I want to help people get closer to what they do. Because if somebody has a, like a friend of mine has a great vision to go, like he really wants to like impact the education system. Like his parents worked in the educational system. He thinks it makes absolutely no sense. And he wants to go build a school create all new curriculum and create his version of the SAT or ACT and like showcase to employers like why it works and why his version of educating kids is the best way. Um, you can't do that if you don't have cash. So, right, like he's somebody that I'm looking into now, like we have meetings all the time about like how he's starting his business, how he's managing, you know, taxes and finances and all other stuff to uh, literally just like make his money and immediately put it over to his vision and start funding that. So that is just one thing that like, I didn't wake up and it, it didn't like come to me in a dream. It's just, I really pay attention to like what gets me fired up and, and what doesn't get me fired up. And that's one of the things that like, you could probably notice. Like I'm just getting excited talking about it because that's just like what I enjoy doing. And literally like after this, if I scroll over to the calendar, I have one of those calls today with somebody else. that's like trying to, to do something personally with his family and really wants to retire his parents. And he's got this business that's doing well. Like I get the opportunity to help him go do that. And, for me, that gets me fired up helping others. And for them, it's it gets them fired up because they're one step closer to what they want to do. Yeah, it's beautiful when you find a mission of serving people and can help in any given moment using your experiences to help other people. It's just a, a feeling I hope everyone experiences at some point in their life. But yeah. on the topic of money, I want to yeah. ask about this quote you have, which is money is easy to make because I'm sure a lot of people will hear that money is easy to make and either say, no, that's not true or, or disagree with it. So yeah. what led you to make that statement? Um, 
Yeah, that one didn't make many friends. I had a couple of people. I had a couple of interesting DMs. Um, uh, two two reasons, right? I, I'm a big believer of like the the positive affirmation. Um, and it's funny that I say that, you know, me five years ago would have been like, that's crazy. That doesn't work. Uh, but every day, and if I had my journal wherever, uh, every day I write, uh, money is easy to make and I'm compensated generously for my work. Uh, and it's one thing that like I, I affirm to myself daily because for me, I think money is, is easy to work because there's always problems in the world. And each of us have this unique gift or ability, whether or not you found it of like, someone's going to pay you for something. Um, but the simple fact of like me stating that money is easy to make, it kind of helps me rewire my brain of the fact of like, I had a mental model that money was hard to make. And it comes back to the fact that when I was a kid, you know, my mom and dad were blue collar workers. They, they worked a ton of time. Like I remember uh, we did Christmas at nighttime because my mom had to work during Christmas during the day, or, you know, maybe a holiday was uh, Thanksgiving was the day after because we couldn't get off of work for Thanksgiving and things like that. I had this mental model that I just had to, you know, bust it every single day to go make money. And now it's like, you know, I don't, think success is actually that hard. I'm going to challenge myself to rewire my brain and just make that the, the OS that I'm working under. So part of that tweet is like a, it's a constant reminder to myself that money is easy to make. And I challenge a lot of people that like, for me, I, I you know, I'm at the state of the business is now I'm going for 150, 200,000, $250,000 a month. But it starts with the understanding that you can just go make a hundred dollars uh, without working 12 hours at $8 an hour or whatever. So my biggest challenge to people is like, if you think it's impossible, go make a hundred dollars this weekend, you know, go, go figure out a method, challenge yourself and see if it can happen. And I've surprised a lot of people, but yeah, I think it, money is easy to make comes from a fact that I continually affirm it to myself, but money isn't anything special. You're, you're helping somebody do something that they don't understand. And right. I do websites and SEO, you do podcasts, but like, what else could we help with? Right? Like, I'm sure I could probably help somebody set up a home studio like we did right before this call. Some Somebody would pay me for that, right? So it's really beginning to understand the fact that like money as a tool or as a value isn't actually that hard to get. You first have to understand what you're good at. I think that's the biggest help for people to overcome is reframing their brain that like they're actually good enough at something that somebody will pay them for their knowledge. Um, it's, it's definitely something that I struggled with as like a W-2 employee. I'm not getting paid for my knowledge. I'm getting paid to kind of show up, but I'm getting paid the bare minimum. And it flips it on its head that somebody actually just pays you for an outcome, not necessarily an hourly, an hourly outcome. If that makes sense. Yeah. How do you, yeah, it does. How do you figure out what you're good at? Yeah, man. So I, I always say, and you've probably heard the business advice of like niche down, like find a niche and, and riches are in your niches or things like that. Um, I absolutely hate that statement. Uh, dude, I did everything. Like, and it's not always the best, but I did everything under the sun whenever I started the business because I had no idea what I was good at. Like, I wasn't putting a bunch of niches in a hat and a bunch of services and picking two out and being like, all right, cool, uh, real estate video, that's my thing now. Like, this is what I'm good at because I feel like that's like the common advice. Dude, I was doing uh, Google My Business listings. I was doing social media management. I was doing videography work. I was a photographer, a very bad one for probably a month and a half. I was doing everything under the sun to see what I could get paid for. Uh, and I really think that is is how you go about and do it. Again, similar to the vision, you're not just going to wake up and something's not going to hit you in the head. And you're going to be like, wow, this is exactly what I need to do and go build a million dollar business. Because if you would have asked me two years ago, if, uh, I would, you know, thought I'd be running a seven figure agency with web and SEO as a service lines. I tell you no, because I probably didn't know what SEO stood for. And I probably didn't know how to build a website. And both of those are accurate, to be fair. Uh, but I got out and like that fired me up because I did it for one of my friends. Uh, he was the first website I ever built. I built it for free. Uh, and I distinctly remember it. It was finals week at the college I went to. I was a junior. Um, and I hated studying. And I hated college. <laughs> but I was like, what can I be doing? I was like, I texted my friend. His name was Will. And I was like, Will, have you ever thought of a, a personal website? And he was like, no. And I was like, can I just build you one? And he was like, sure. Uh, and like, you're kind of hesitant. I whipped one up real quick, loved it. I uh, did it all the day. He loved it. It was like, okay, this is really, this, this fires me up. This is cool. Um, and I did the same thing since then, right? I, I figured out the service, the web and SEO, uh, but I still work across, man, like four or five industries. And one thing that we want to hone in this year is like, of those four or five, what's the one that I really want to hone in on? Because I want to get the business to the next level. And I think that's at that point, that's what you need to do. But from zero to maybe six figures or really zero to where you 
note you like, that niche should go out the window and you should just have fun doing work and figuring out what really brings you energy because, man, there's a lot of things I did that I hated. Like I hate video production. I hated photography. I don't do that anymore. Like I, I don't love certain industries, so I don't work in them anymore. But the only way you figure that out is if you actually go do it. Um, and that's where I'm uh, maybe to a fault. I, I take action before really thinking. Uh, but for me, it's like, man, I'm going to think about it, but I'm not going to know the answer. It's not going to come to me in a dream. I might as well just go do it and see if I like it. And I'm one step closer to the right solution. That makes a lot of sense. And what was the first situation where you actually got paid for building a website? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I remember it. And I almost didn't get paid, uh, which is the fun part, because I was afraid to ask for cash. Uh, I was in college and it was a local co uh, it was a local co-working company. It was like one of the first larger deals. Like I had gotten paid for like small things, but this was like a full project. And I walk in and I remember I think I quoted at two thousand dollars for like a pretty large website. And then he like looked at the price and looked at me and looked back down at the price. And I remember I was about to say, you know, I, I'll do it for free if you give me a free co-working pass. Um, the backstory is I already had a free co-working pass because the college students got it for free. So I was literally about to talk myself out of $2,000. Before I could do that, he was like, yep, this works. Like, uh, I'll go ahead and sign it. And he got the pen, signed it, and then he had a check. He got the check, put the two grand on it, and gave it to me. And I was like, yeah, my jaw probably dropped on the floor. But I was like, hold on. Like, I almost lost this just because I was afraid of doing it. Uh, and that was the first, like, where I actually made, you know, I was doing like $100, $200 websites, but I was just building and changing the buttons. Like, this was the first big project that I remember. Uh, and it definitely set me on a tear because I was like, man, that was easy. Like, I had one deal, <laughs> I gave him the price, and he said, okay. And then I got paid. And I was like, if it could only be that easy every single time. And uh, ironically, it's pretty, pretty darn close once you get up to the scale that we're at. But, yeah, that was the first big one. And uh, I always remember the fact that I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I almost talked myself out of it. Just out of scarcity mindset that I was like, no one would ever pay two grand for a website. So you said you went on a tear after that. What what happened next? Yeah, I well, I did the project. Um, and actually, I for one of the first websites I did on my own and, and learning how to do it, I, I did quite well. But it was like, uh, my thought process is I always try and bring stuff down to the micro level because it's easier to understand. So it's not, you know, how do I build a seven figure business? It's a $2,000 website. And let's say I want to make a hundred thousand in a year. How do I get 50 more fusion 54 clients? Okay. Where do I find them? How do I hunt them down? How do I get on the phone with them? And I immediately just kind of started playing the math game of like, I need 50 websites and I just did one. So I need 49 more. Uh, what other 49 do I need? And like average it out over months. And literally it was actually probably two two years ago this time. Um, yeah, it was right at the beginning of the year because I remember I was like pacing it on months. So I was like, okay, how many websites do I need to get every week? I need to get one a week. So that means I need to get this many leads in the pipeline and like close this many people. So I started playing the math game and I literally, I have an Excel sheet that like has tabs at the bottom, but like V1 tab of that Fusion 54 was on there of like, you know, I need to reach out to like 120 people a week to get one deal. And like, I had all the math figured out and still use a similar model to this day of like growing the business. Um, but that like got, I think the ball was rolling. That definitely rolled it quick enough to where I was like, this might actually be possible because, you know, two grand to a junior or whatever I was in college is, yeah, you might as well be a millionaire. And I was like, this is yeah. amazing. And that was really like, it, they, he didn't ask me my hourly rate. He didn't ask me any of that. He just wanted the outcome. It was paying me for the outcome. And it gave me the opportunity to like, okay, now I have a system to go make money. I just need a system to fulfill. What prevents me from copying and pasting that system over and over and over and over and over for all these different clients? What's Fusion 54? That was that was a co-working spot. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. It. And, um, sure it's still up. <laughs> and so like what is the process you would recommend for somebody who wants to start building websites for companies and they're saying, okay, like, I, I know I need to close these websites. I know I need, yep. I need to close these companies. What do I do? What's the first steps that you'd recommend to that person? Yeah. I always say, even if you're, if you know how to build a website, you don't know how to build a website. You're, you're uncomfortable with building a website. That's probably the right spot to be. 
um, I would go get, go get a paying customer. And, and there's not like a specific strategy, um, but make it known to your circle that you are now building websites and people can pay you to build websites. And, and just watch what happens because you'll be surprised because I think a lot of people kind of psych themselves out. And I'm like, look, you know, you got what, 900 followers on your Instagram or whatever. And, you know, a lot of them are high schoolers or your friends or college friends, which is fine. Po- make a post, tell everybody you're writing websites or building websites and that you're going to give the next person 25% off. Uh, just, yeah, just like put it out to the world and see what happens and, and kind of returns to the world. That's what I always say to people like struggling with the client side and on the website side of things, um, YouTube and Google are great resources. Type in how to build a website, like the process of building a website and follow the directions. Um, Cause between like an Instagram post and YouTube and Google, you probably have a strategy to go make an extra 30, 40, 50 grand a year, just building websites for people and doing a good job. Um, the one thing I always say is never do free work um, because if they're going to let you do free work, they probably have enough money to pay you and you might as well get paid because it comes back to the coaching thing, right? If that client's paying you, they're way more invested into the solution as well. And it's going to be a better outcome. It's fascinating that it's possible for so many people, but fear stops. What, what do you think is the, is the unlock for somebody to let go of that fear to actually post this is what I'm doing now. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, even myself as a kid, I probably didn't get, I probably was not told no enough uh, to where getting told no scares the crap out of me, right? Like I, I never want to get into a situation, have someone say no. And to me, like I've modeled that in my brain as like the most uncomfortable thing in the world. And I, you got to work around that. I, I feel like that is, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but I feel like that's a lot of it like, parents want to do a great job and they raise you to not say no and they want to give you the world, but it kind of backfires whenever you get in uncomfortable situations. You're only used to hearing yes. And then as you know, you're immediately like, if I'm not getting hundred percent, yes, I'm not even going to put myself in that situation because getting no, told no is the worst thing that could happen to me. And then you quickly realize that getting told no is just a daily part of life. And, and the sooner that you understand that, the, the better off you're going to be because for you, right? Like you've probably reached out to plenty of podcast guests You've probably been told no plenty of times. The quicker you get numb to the no, I feel like the better off you can be. That is a hurdle that I, we could probably do a whole four hour podcast on. It's just like getting told no is a big hurdle for a lot of people. And a lot of people don't ever get, they never hear no. Me included though. Yeah, I'm not I think, an exception. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, at least with the podcast, it's something that I believe I can give value to the person. If it's, even if it's just my energy and questions. And so I don't care about being told no, because I'm saying to myself, I'm providing something and I'm doing this for a a long time and I'm going to do this for a long time. So therefore getting told no once isn't really that big of a deal because I know in 10 years that person's going to want to say yes. So yep. I think having a long-term view of something like, oh, this person, this company could say no because I'm building their website. And, but if you have it in your head, I'm going to be building websites for a long time, then it's more of like, okay, like, like it's fine to hear that one. No. But if you say, I'm going to stop doing this, it's then difficult. Yeah. It's one of those things that like change your time horizon, right? Like a lot of people get the business mm-hmm. and like, all right, I got to make a hundred grand in the next two weeks. Okay, why two? Like, why two weeks? Did you just pull it out of a hat? Did someone tell you that two weeks was the magic number? Entirely arbitrary. And that's where I was just like, for me, it wasn't like a big goal. It was just, uh, I want to survive as an entrepreneur for a year and never have to ask someone else for money. As soon as I like that was just Mm -hmm. that was the goal. And a year was probably, you know, it probably could have been ten years. Like, I just wanted to get over the hump, survive. Like, I, I didn't want to do anything crazy, and wasn't trying to set arbitrary goals and. You know, now it kind of changes, right? What got you here isn't going to get you to the next phase. So now it is a lot of like challenging myself and setting these weird arbitrary goals of like, I'm going to go close $400,000 of business in the next two weeks. Completely arbitrary. I pulled it out of a hat. It means nothing, but like, it's a good little competitive challenge to get me out of bed in the morning and like get me closer. Um, But yeah, at the start, I think a lot of people like get these hard goals and like, man, I didn't hit the goal. I I must not be doing it right. I'm going to quit. Well, like, okay, was your goal fair to yourself? Like, did you really have the momentum and the knowledge to set something like that? Or, you know, could we dial it back and maybe not be as aggressive, but 
slowly build momentum through daily actions to go after the big goal later. So coaching is something that you obviously enjoy doing. If you're coaching somebody, what are the, the small actions or just the actions you'd recommend somebody take who has no experience in website building? Yeah, I normally tell them, uh, right, building the website's easy. And I actually think that because I can log on and I can type in, you know, platforms build a website and I'm going to get a list that's like Wix or Weebly or Squarespace or WordPress or Webflow. And there you go. There are my five options. Nothing actually keeps me from building it. I think the thing that phases people out is the ask of like, can I build you a website? Uh, and I got somebody that's working now that they have a mental block about getting new clients. They only take referrals because at that point, referrals are closed. Uh, and my biggest challenge to her was go ask somebody to build, like ask them if you could build them a website. And I was like, the one caveat is you, like you can't know, know them. They can't be family. They can't be friends. They can't be clients. Like go ask somebody that you kind of know if you can build them a website and get really uncomfortable. Uh, and that's always my first step. Some people don't take it. Some people do, but it's actually, I was like, you know how to build a website. Like you, I was like, you know, quote unquote, whoever their name is. I was like, walk me through how to build a website. And they're like, okay, I do this first, this second, this third, this fourth. I'm like, okay, well, what's stopping you from doing that for other people? And they're like, I just don't, I don't have anybody to build a website for right now. And I was like, okay, cool. Solution is simple. You go ask somebody off the street if you can build them a website and see what happens. Uh, mm. You know, one, they'll get told no. But two, I was like, uh, one person I'm thinking of did it and uh, they got a yes. Uh, and the person was actually like, you're not doing that for free. Like, I'm going to pay you to do it. And they got a quick like $2,500 off of just like literally asking somebody that they kind of knew at a coffee shop. And I was like, you, you just got to get, take action. I, I guess is the thing I'm getting at. Just like, we can all overanalyze it, but the quicker, like for you in a podcast, like the quicker you buy a mic and download Riverside is one step closer to getting the podcast. Uh, and if you got no listeners, that's fine. Like taking the action and doing the process is much more important than the goal in a lot of ways. It's all in your own head is the, is. the takeaway for me. And, and it's so often we get in our own way. Um, I want to ask about building uh, a presence online, building, I think on LinkedIn, you got something like 20,000 followers on, on Twitter. Yeah. You're building it up. It's cool to see. What, when did you say, I want to start building a presence online? Did you even, was it even a conscious thing? How did you go about doing it? Take us through that process. Yeah, it was definitely conscious. Um, it was one of those things that uh, listening to Gary Vaynerchuk way back when, uh, and also, you know, going to an internship that I absolutely hated. Uh, <laughs> you know, what, what, what else do you do at work whenever there, you don't have much to do? Uh, you don't enjoy any of the work and you're behind a computer all day. Well, you network and you meet people and you start building a presence. So one of the first things I did, if you scroll way back on that LinkedIn, is I was just documenting my internship process. Um, one of the ones was more fun, junior year, the, that one. I was just documenting what, what was up, what was I doing every day, what was I learning, things like that. What did I equally hate and not ever want to do again? And I was just kind of throwing it out there to the world, and uh, I started making like friends from that. Like other people in internships are like, "Man, I hate this job." Like I, we we don't like the same thing. We do like the same thing, and that's really cool. Uh, and it was very like uh, purposeful. But my my process was always like, you know, even moving schools and like learning how to make friends. I didn't always, you know, connect with everybody. I was always a tad different and I could never figure it out why. And it was always, I think I was prone to putting myself in more uncomfortable situations. And a lot of people just don't want to do that. So for me, it was not necessarily a follower saying that I was going after. It was like, hold on, I made this post and I'm thinking of one person named Jordan Paris, who's a friend of mine. And we both geeked out over like this one thing about the education system and we're tight now. Like, he actually like is helping me build one of the companies that we have in the portfolio. And it was, for me, it was just like, cool, if I do this with an intention, I'm going to have a lot of friends. And like, that was just a huge thing for me. And, and now, I mean, if I look at my iPhone and I'm, I'll throw it on the video. Like if I'm looking at this little pinned section of like who I'm talking to the most, um, outside of my girlfriend and my parents, uh, the other six are all people I met online that either now work mm. for me, we've built a company together or we're like best friends. Um, and that was really it for me. And it was just like, I was getting on LinkedIn every day as a college kid, just talking about my experience, but wanting to just talk to people and meet friends, make best friends and, and talk about business and talk about things that were interesting. And dude, I kind of looked up a year, year and a half later and I was at 20, you might know the number better than I do now, like 20, 21,000. It was like, whoa, 
Like, this is really, really cool. And yeah, for me, it was just the fact of like, I, I never look at the followers, but I definitely want to build the social presence because um, I come from a speaking background as we talk about a little bit with like TED Talks and TEDx Talks. I always put it in the sense of a venue. So our venue that I hosted an event that was 350 people. Our speakers would freak out with 350 people. But for me, like, you know, every time I think of that, it was called Ball Arena. And I, you know, I make a Twitter post and I get uh, 10,000 impressions. And I don't know, let's say it's 1,000 views and people read it. I'm like, well, that's three ball arenas. That's really cool. Uh, that's the, like the way my brain thinks about it now. And it's always just like, I've always wanted to create an impact and like share what I'm learning to people that are interested in it. And I always bring it back to like the, the speaking analogy of the fact of like, you know, if I do this well, like I'm going to have a great platform online that actually allows me to go share what I'm up to make friends. But also for me, like whenever I started business, there are multiple people that I followed to get me over the hump of like getting comfortable making money and getting clients and things like that. Many David that is following me now that I actually don't even know exist, he or she's stalking me and watching all that I put out. And it's almost like my due diligence of making sure that's the case of like, I, I want to put that good out into the world so somebody else can do the same thing I did. It's beautiful, man. And so if you had to give a TED Talk today, what would that TED Talk be about? I think it's probably probably a little bit on that money side of the sense of like, you know, being a 24-year-old kid, I think I have a very interesting mindset on the money thing. And it's that one, it's easy to make, but two, you, like no one needs that much. Uh, and we should like find a way to make it and like actually go put it back into the world. I think that's one, because that's uh, the reason I say that. I don't know if it'd be the one that I personally want to talk about, but when I do talk about it, it makes a lot of people either upset or a lot of people like, oh my goodness, thank you for saying that, which tells me that like something, somebody should be talking about it more. And if it's me, I'm happy to do it. But I think it would be that. And uh, man, the other one I'd say as well is just like that link of uh, like your business problems or your personal problems. Like if you think you have business issues, take a real hard look at the founder. If you aren't the founder, like challenge the founder, take a look at him or herself. Because I mean, I'm even seeing it in a couple of her clients, like eight, nine figure clients. Uh, and they are struggling with like certain issues. And I literally see it from the found, like the, I can see it in the founder and I see it in the business. And I'm like, uh, it, it is an extension of yourself. Like you're growing up with it. Uh, and I just think that's super interesting. And I, I think those would probably be one of, one of the two I would definitely speak on. Well, I can't wait to hear you give a Ted talk of some sort in your career or life because you're a great speaker. You have great ideas and uh, I'm really appreciative for you coming on this podcast today. Where can people connect with you further? What's the best place? Is it LinkedIn or Twitter? Yeah, LinkedIn's going to be good. Um, Twitter is going to be the best because I'm trying to get more active on there and trying to find my circle. Uh, both of those, LinkedIn, if you type in David W. Riggs, you'll find me. Uh, Twitter is D. William Riggs. And then uh, outside of that, like I'll, I'll make the same thing. Like I said, I love letting people pick my brain. If, if you're out there starting a business, uh, trying to figure out websites, SEO, or just want to chat, um, uh, find me somewhere, DM me, and I'll get back to you. <laughs> it's a pretty good billboard out there, and uh, we'll put all those links below. Thank you, David, Perfect. for taking the time. Really appreciative, and I'm really happy we got to do this. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on.